Welcome to Channel 17, the Town of Colony Government Channel. I'm a recovering addict. My name is Mike T, and this is my story on Inside Addiction. Mike, tell me a little bit about how it was uh, growing up. Growing up, um, I grew up in the inner city of Washington, D.C. Um, I grew up in uh, this Christian, politically motivated, neo hippie commune. Uh, that was started by my uncle. His name is Jim Wallace. Um, it was it was uh, an in interesting growing up. Um, I grew up in a predominantly black neighborhood. My parents were white. Um, I'm biracial. Uh, I grew up in a. Uh, uh, my folks felt very hypocritical about working with poor people and living in the suburbs so they moved us right in um, I uh, so it was just a it was a lot of contrast I went to uh, almost an all-white school uh, in a very wealthy neighborhood and then I would come home to uh, you know a neighborhood that was product predominantly black and impoverished and uh, so it was just like, you know, one extreme of this, one extreme of that. Um, learned on the streets, you know, if, um, if somebody hits you, you come back with a bat. If they come back with a bat, you come back with a knife, so on and so forth. In my home, it was, you know, if somebody assaults you, then you turn the other cheek. So it was, uh, it was interesting. I got a lot of mixed messages. Um, I'm also adopted, so that took a lot of um, it was it was traumatic uh, as much as I knew and understood that what was done for me as far as my adoption goes was done with my best interest in mind and I still believe that to this day um, it still created um, some uh, some um, issues with me um, issues with feeling accepted, issues with feeling worthy, um, issues with self-esteem, things like that. Um, those were always fostered. Those uh, things were always fostered to the best of their ability by my parents. I mean, I did not grow up in an abusive household. I did not grow up in, you know, any kind of um, mental anguish or emotional um, turmoil you know, as a result of my parents, but just as a result of a lot of the questions that I had from my adoption and some of the, the um, extremes in my life. Um, I eventually found drugs at the age of 13. So tell me about the first time that you used when you, you found drugs at age 13. It was like a light bulb went off. Um, <clears throat> like most people, the first drug I used was alcohol. Um, and my parents were big and throwing parties and uh, things like that, um, potluck dinners. And they would have, my mom would make sangria, big vats of like five gallon buckets, like, uh, like um, you know, drywall mud buckets full of uh, sangria. They'd, they'd buy the wine and then they'd cut up their own fruit and they'd let it sit for days. Um, and I used to, you know, like kids, I used to steal snippets of it. I wanted to be a, a, an adult, you know, I wanted to be a grown-up, but I ended up liking the taste of it. Um, so one time when she wasn't looking, I, uh, I grabbed like a uh, 7-Eleven Big Gulp cup. It was like the first time that they had actually made like these plastic take-home collector's cups. And I grabbed one of those and I dipped it in the bucket and I ran upstairs to my room with it. 
Um, and I drank the whole thing. Uh, and it was like, I felt free. I felt, um, you know, totally open. I felt like I could say or do anything. I felt very empowered. Um, and from that point on, I was completely enslaved to a feeling. So let's get into, uh, real deep into the progression of your use. It started with alcohol, what it progressed to, and the overall, you know, uh, track that that ultimately took, starting with um, that, you know, cup dipped in the bucket <laughs> that day at age 13. Okay. Um, my progression was rapid. Um, it was pretty obvious that I was, uh, I was an addict, I would say from the jump in retrospect, but not too long after that, that incident with the wine, um, it was very obvious. Uh, <clears throat> I used to, I have a sister who's 11, year, 11 years younger than I am, and I used to babysit her on Wednesday nights when my parents went to Bible study. And uh, I, uh, I would wait until my parents left and I would watch them out the windows. They would go around the corner and I would go out the back door and run down to the little local bodega. And uh, they'd sell to anybody. Um, and I would buy a six pack of Black Label. Um, and I would turn around and come back and I would get drunk while I babysat my sister while she was asleep upstairs. I was totally alone. Um, there was no, there was never anything social about using for me. I think it created avenues for me in social constructs that I could be a little more free, open, um, willing to say and speak to certain people, girls, especially uh, as a teenager. Um, that maybe I wouldn't have spoken to or took opportunities that I may not have normally taken. Um, but there was also nothing social about the way that I used. It was, it was about me getting completely intoxicated, completely inebriated, um, as much as I could possibly handle, and then allowing other people to take care of me and get me home. Um, so it was a totally self-centered act from the beginning. Um, I, was, you know, 13 was the first time I got drunk, and then at by the age of 15, I was already in trouble in school. Um, I was uh, I was selling marijuana, pornography, and alcohol in out of my locker in Catholic school. Um, <laughs> it's a proud moment. Um, <laughs> I, uh, and I was expelled, uh, from, from that school for, for, for that. But you were everybody's friend. <laughs> I was. Everybody but the dean. Um, <clears throat> until, you know, until the pressure came down, until it actually got real. And somebody had to take a fall for something and there were consequences involved. And then all of my friends were like, it's him. <laughs> um, I was doing whippets and I passed out in the locker room and uh, I woke up to probably every student's worst nightmare. His uh, homeroom teacher, uh, the dean of students, the principal, and the maintenance guy all standing over him, uh, you know, asking me if I was okay. Uh, they ended up searching my locker after that and they found all of this stuff and I was expelled. Um, I had a and that was probably my first experience with like losing something that wasn't um, that wasn't like material or 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 monetary. Um, <clears throat> I was on a scholarship to that school for uh, for football, and um, I I lost it. Um, I, I lost that that aspect of my life. I've never played football since. It was something that I really loved. Um, and it, it caused some, uh, some pain for me. Um, so I guess after that, <clears throat> the progression, it just got worse. It, I, I was kicked out of school, so I ended up going to a public school. And in that avenue, in that school, I was able to um, 
hook up with some old using buddies and uh <clears throat> you know, I quickly figured out, like in a public school, you know, you get lost real easy. You can cut school and nobody knows. Um, real easy, you can cut school and nobody knows. Um, so I spent the majority of the second half of my sophomore semester hanging out in a Dunkin' Donuts, uh, smoking pot and playing spades. Um, it was pretty embarrassing when my parents showed up for a parent-teacher conference and my math teacher didn't even know who I was. Um, so uh, it, was, uh, it was difficult. Um, by 17, I had completely dropped out. I was running away regularly. I was taking <clears throat> planes, trains, and automobiles to New York City to try to score different various types of drugs that were a little harder to get where I was and I was bringing them down and selling them off to my friends for a minor profit um, but more for the feeling of like being the man being the guy who was connected which you know um, really helped my esteem issues that I talked about before about not feeling wanted not feeling worthy stuff like that um, but again as soon as all of the dope was gone all of the drugs were gone like all of the friends were gone um, my folks uh, <clears throat> saw a lot of what was going on. They were right on the front lines with me. They were not, um, they were not uh, shy souls by any means. Um, so they challenged me. They, they did everything that they could to kind of push back, you know, and uh, with the, this addiction thing, I was sent to rehab twice um, before I was even old enough to drive. So when was it that you knew you needed help? <clears throat> so if you were going to fill in the blank, hey, I knew I needed help when? <laughs> oh, man, I needed help. <clears throat> If I'm, if I'm going to be honest, I mean, really, like, I knew uh, there was something not right about the way that I got high and used compared to my friends from the time I was 16, by the second stint in rehab. Um, so, you know, it was, it was pretty obvious. I just didn't want the help at that point. I thought that there was... You know, I thought it was like, well, I might be an alcoholic or I might be a drug addict, but, you know, I see all these people on television who are alcoholics and drug addicts and they get through it. You know, um, they go to rehab or they go to, you know, some kind of a psych ward and then they get out and then they're, they're all better again. Um, all of my, uh, my idols growing up, like people in the metal and uh, music world. You know, it was all over the magazines, Hit Parader and Circus and um, Kerrang! and all this other stuff. Um, so they would go to rehab, they'd get better, they'd be partying again. I never thought there was really anything wrong. I think the first time I really realized, though, that it really sunk in with me that there was a problem um, was well after high school. I was like 21. No, I was, I was I think I was 20 years old. I was playing in a band. When we were out of town. Um, I'd been using heroin pretty regularly at that point. And when I didn't get any dope that night before the show, like, I felt sick. And at that point, I knew that I had a problem that I, it was going to take something more than just me um, uh, showing up at, uh, you know, some detox, 14 day detox or 28 day, you know, dry out place to, to deal with. Um, I knew it was going to be something that was going to be with me for the rest of my life. So you go when you get help? Yeah, I got, um, <laughs> I didn't really get help. Uh, help was given to me. Um, I, I, I never wanted to get clean. I never wanted to stop. Um, there was always something else that was more of the issue than, than my problem with substances. Um, 
it was the girlfriend, it was my parents, uh, it was the legal system, it was whomever. Um, but finally, um, May 6th of 2003, I got given an option by uh, the state, by the court system, by the New York State court system. They said, you can go to treatment and try to get sober again, um, or you can go to prison. Uh, and just, you know, do what we think you're going to do anyway. Um, so I went to treatment thinking I was going to, you know, bide some time. Um, but uh, I ended up being challenged in treatment and I was in a place where I was able to listen. I was able to hear something. Um, and my counselor you know, basically said, why don't you try the one thing that you haven't tried in all of these years of using? Um, I was 20, uh, I was 29 years old. Um, everything that I owned fit into a duffel bag uh, and a guitar case. That uh, Everything I owned fit in the cab of a pickup truck. Um, and so I was pretty beaten at that point. I had uh, one I had an 18-month-old son that I didn't see, and I had another one on the way um, who I was afraid I was never going to see. And I had a prison term looming over my head. So, you know, getting clean seemed like a decent option at the time. Um, I thought that maybe it was something that I might want to give a, sh a good shot to. So tell me how it's been uh, since you got sober. <laughs> wow. Uh, it's only a half hour show, but we, we got some time here. So. Um, <clears throat> it's been a 180 degree turn, turnaround. Um, things that I never thought possible before became possible. I don't, I don't want to sound cliche, like, you know, uh, but it's true. Um, I never gave myself enough credit. I never gave myself anything past being like a a short order cook in some half-ass restaurant uh, and that being my lot in life but um, I was able to go to school uh, I got a degree uh, actually in chem depth counseling um, I've worked as a counselor for uh, on behalf of chemically addicted people um, since October of 2005 um, I, uh, I've been married, I've been divorced, uh, I'm now engaged. Again, um, I have a relationship with both of my children. Um, that is just, it's something that I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't trade for the world. Um, the relationship with my family uh, has been renewed and 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 um, repaired and enhanced. Uh, you know, my parents wouldn't have you know they wouldn't have pissed on my shoes if they were on fire um, a little over nine years ago. Uh, but uh, today, you know, I can call them for anything: emotional support, spiritual support. Uh, just to laugh, um, to share something funny with them, which is never something I was able to do. Um, I uh, just recently had them out at my, out here in New York. They live in California now. I recently had them here in New York, um, you know, for the holidays to stay at my home with my partner and their grandson, which was just a, a, a beautiful, beautiful thing. So, I guess, peace of mind. Since you've been sober, um, was there ever a time that you questioned your ability to remain sober? Or when, can you think of any time where your sobriety has really been tested? Like, the hardest part of being sober since you've been sober? And how you got through it? Yeah. Uh, there, there have been. There have been a couple. Um, most of them, ironically enough, have to do with my past catching up with me. Mm. I think a lot of people get, get clean and, and they get sober and they think, well, 
I'm doing all these good things now. Um, you know, nothing from my past is, everything has been negated. You know, like it's clean just, slate. yeah, exactly, clean slate. And I think for, I think in a lot of ways, you know, recovery works that way. Um, you know, f miraculously, you know, people get clean and all of a sudden, people who wanted their heads on a platter all of a sudden feel like, well, okay, this guy had a problem and he's doing something about it, you know, and we'll cut him some compassion. Um, the New York State Unified Court System is not that way. <laughs> um, uh, so, uh, you know, I did some things while I was using uh, involving my oldest son um, that ended up that ended up with me uh, violating some orders, some court orders that had been put in place. Um, I kind of thought that that stuff had gone away. My ex, however, uh, did Re not. Remember it. She, she continued to remember it. Um, and so while I was in my second year of school, three weeks, about ready, three weeks before graduation, in front of my soon-to-be supervisor at St. Joseph's Addiction Treatment Center, I was arrested in class uh, for a violation, for four violations of an order of protection, all of which are felony charges. Um, and at two and a half years clean, I found myself staring down the barrel of a seven and a half year prison sentence that I thought I had dodged. Um, and I was engaged to be married. I had a family. Um, I had a wedding that was that had been planned. Um, and eventually, what I ended up finding out was I was going to spend the next six months in jail as part of a plea bargain. And trying to figure out how I got there, you know, at two and a half years clean, I thought that once I stopped using, I'd stop going to jail. But that didn't. I'm not the I'm not the addict that can say that. There's a lot of them that can. But uh, I'm, I'm not. Um, I will say that doing the right thing uh, does have its benefits. You know, I, I went through all of this. I ended up taking a six-month plea bargain. But what no one had looked into was because I had done so much time on this charge already from, like, three and a half years ago that, like, by the time I got into the jail, I had four days left to do with good time. So I thought I was going in to do six months, I ended up doing 36 hours, and I was released. So, uh, you know, there's some ancillary benefits to it. In the last few moments, talk about um, what your message would be to someone that's watching, um, someone out there that's still sick and suffering. What would your message be as a, a person in recovery? Don't quit. Um, don't quit on yourself. Um, I did, and I was lucky enough to not have people that were willing to quit on me. Um, and I ended up getting help anyway, despite my best efforts. Um, but if you think that it's hopeless, if you think that you can't get off of the corner, if you think that you're stuck in whatever situation is you're stuck in, whether it be domestic, economic, um, you know, physiological or psychological, um, any, anybody who is constitutionally capable of being honest with themselves can be in recovery and can experience a life change beyond anything that they are probably giving themselves credit for. Um, all you have to do is stop using and stop taking your own advice. Welcome to Channel 17. 
the Town of Colony Government Channel.